Design. Craft. Art. What's the balance? Art. Artist. Time. A designer, in my, in my words, and as far as I feel about it, is a designer is an artist who has chosen to paint on the stage or work on the stage to design for the theater or for the performing arts. They're an artist who chooses to create on the stage. So how do you do television then, which is a commercial medium in which both the actors, the directors, the designers, and the Much writers are turned into technical craft. kind I, of... I find that to be a little bit more craft. But you see, I bring my art, my artist approach to, 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 to things. Right. You know, especially in the period films and that do, is I bring the artist to the camera as well. But, but it, the dialogue I have with the director of photography and, and with the director, etc., is a lot more of a craft. The early stages of it, I do drawings. I, I do set renderings and drawings and that, and costume drawings like I did for you with Bizet. I did all those as an artist. And then they d turned over to the technicians I created on the streets of Prague or in a studio or whatever the case may be. But from that moment on, I supervise as a craftsman. So I go and see Jersey Boys. Mm -hmm. I don't see any art. I see a ton of craft. I see a ton of tech. And, and I see a ton of, of spazzle. I see dazzle, razzle, spazzle. Sure. I don't see any art. How, how about the Peter Greenaway films? The Ridley Scott films? And how do you live in a world where the Peter Greenaway films are live on the marginal circuit, are only seen marginally, whereas Jersey Boys plays for years in New York, London, Toronto, whatever. How do you live in that world? I live in it because I will go look at a Peter Greenaway film and I will come out being enriched. And, right. But a lot of other people will look at it and, you know, they hate it. You know, but I, I know people who hated Prospero's book, which is just a nothing but inspire me. You know, it's a... Uh, I would love to work on a Peter Greenaway film. I would love to just be... Beside. Or a Terry Gilliam film. Yeah, I mean, there's so many of them, you know, that around that I would just love to be there. When my, I was shooting a film in Vancouver, and, and at the end of the film, when it wrapped, a friend of mine was a set decorator on Carnal Knowledge, which was the Mike Nichols film. And I said, get me a day or two, get me a job on, as a set decorator. I want to watch Nichols work. And he did. He hired me. And? He, you know, and? <laughs> I've got more stories about that film than you've got ca a tape on your camera, I can tell you. Right. But the end result was watching Mike Nichols work. I was astounded. I loved how he worked. He had some real idiosyncrasies like noise and sound. If he heard a noise on the soundstage when he was blocking or directing a scene, he would have that person who made it fired. It didn't matter who it was. Nobody moved when Mike Nichols was directing. Nobody moved. Final question. How's the art doing these days? Right now? In some cases, it's doing very well, I think. Um, and in other cases, we seem to be falling back on old cliches. In some cases, we're being driven by technology, which I'm not too happy about. But in other cases, I'm seeing things where the technology is being used to reinforce the art and it's doing fine. I think, I think we're at a crossroads right now, Robert, to be quite honest. Things are changing. And one of, one of the things that, that we were talking about with, with Pat Flood on the craftsman versus the artist, and I was saying to you just a little while ago, was for a designer to have an exhibition of work and you're going out there to get funding, who do you get it from? You go to an organization like the Canada Council, they have money to fund theater. They don't consider a design exhibition about theater or costume drawings to be the performance. Right. So you go over to, they say, it's, it's an exhibition is a visual arts thing. It is. You go to visual arts. No, we only f fund artists. You're a craftsman. And this whole thing falls right down the middle, cracks, and you just disappear into the void underneath. <laughs> There's no funding. Um, but you do get it in some places, you know. Like Theatre Ontario has been fantastic about it, the Trillium Fund, you know, things like this. And, you know, 
but it, 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 it is still to this day, still to this day, um, an artist who works in the theatre is, is not always accepted as an artist by other artists, but is accepted only as a craftsperson. I mean, my question is, and there's maybe no answer from you from it, why aren't you championed more? Why isn't your lifelong block of work, incredible as it is, longevity, inspiration, why is that not more championed? Weren't you in the Walk of Fame or whatever those little well, things are on the sidewalk um, outside the theater? I don't know. I mean, they, because there's no category for that kind of champion yet. And I say yet because I think that it, it is coming. I mean, it is coming. If you lived Certainly, in Quebec, if you were a Quebecer, if you were a Quebec, Quebec uh, designer, absolutely. A Francois Barbeau, away oh, you no, go. No, there you go. They, that's there. And in Europe? Oh, no. They re, I mean, the designer. In Russia, for example, and this is really bizarre from your point of view, being an actor and director, a designer in Russia designs the production. They're sonographers. They design the production, and the actors have to act the design, and the director has to direct the design. So why aren't you Russian? <laughs> Spasiba. But no, no, I don't believe in that. I don't believe in that kind of collaboration. I believe in sonography. I do believe in the sonographers like Pam Howard. They, those are, are, are real sonographers. They design the total concept working directly with the director and with the actors. So one more question just to indulge me in that the visual imagination that we live in, right, mm -hmm. of, of, the, of the generations brought up through television and film and the media, so much of the visual world that, that, that we have grown up on is a commercial visual world. Mm -hmm. It's a, a visual set of visual expectations created by television commercials, by billboards, by, you know, if you look at the major part of public imagery, it's for commercials. It's not for arts. Right? It's not the paintings, it's the commercials that are filling the Union Station, you know, the commercials on the walls. It's the commercials that are repeated on television. How do we... As it's called commercial art. It's called commercial art. I'm not and it is forming artist. part of the visual expectations of us. Yeah. You know? I'm, I'm not a commercial artist. That, uh, and and I, I think in some ways there's a whole movement in the U.S., by the way, where they're trying to get rid of billboards on the side of the roads, which it's called, you know, visual distractions, what have you. There's a lady, I think, in Texas or somewhere, where she's got only planting flowers and things and getting rid of billboards, getting rid of all that stuff. Um, yeah, the world is about marketing. There's no doubt about that. It's about commercials. But I don't work in that world. Maybe I do in television, but you butt but up I against don't design the, the commercial break. That's the editor in the in the editing suite. The director is directing it. You know whatever. The but the young is. audiences who walk in and sit in the theaters for which you design, yeah, absolutely, their visual imagination exactly. has been and more formed. My son still goes to the theater and says, when he was younger, not anymore, go to the theater and come out and say, hey, dad, that was a nice movie. He couldn't tell the difference between the word movie and the word theater. For him, it was the same thing. It was a performance in front of him, whether it was on a screen or on a stage. In his very young days, he, couldn't, he didn't know what the word was. The attention span of the individual is much shorter than it was. You used to be able to go to the theater and sit through three hours of, of a play, or whatever the case may be, with two intermissions, you know, etc., etc. Tougher and tougher and tougher for that to happen. We now, as you know, combine acts to get scenes together to create only one intermission. We, they make cuts to text to bring it down in size a bit for a modern audience. In film, the films that I worked with, the period films I worked with, I worked with a director who came out of doing rock concerts. And that's how we, he started his company. It was industrial filming and, and rock concerts. It's David Devine, right? David Devine, yeah. He did genius at it. Genius at it. And he would, told me once that he tries to keep each scene cut with not holding on to a scene for more than seven seconds. Just watch when you're watching television, CSI, or whatever the case may be. A seven second scene before a cut is, is a monumental time. And the kids want zapping. They want zapping. Zap the information. I want to go to the theater, bang, got it, I'm out. That's, that's, that's their world today. So how does that affect you and your design? 
Well, in, 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 in some cases, if I'm designing for a very young audience or something, I will put things into the design that, that it will stimulate them, excite them. And it's certainly um, the directors that we work with will direct in such a way that it's exciting. Things are moving, nothing stands still for a short period of time. You know, we used to call it camouflage designing. Really? Yeah. You know, if you get a scene that is just like a hummer, <laughs> design something that takes place. And by the time the audience comes back to the scene after seeing whatever took place, that scene's over with. Right. And we're getting on with the story. Right. We used to call it camouflage design. <laughs>